One of the other hats I wear in the school is as the Associate Dean for Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion. Um, and so Jen invited me to talk to you about bias, but also upstander and really how we respond. I'm starting to get imposter syndrome around talking about this topic because I talk about it a lot and society is moving forward. And there is an opportunity to talk to people who know more about it or have experiences that are different um, than, than mine. And while everybody's done a lot of individual work around DEI for themselves, I think um, I just wanted to say to you as an audience that one of the reasons I um, continue to talk about this topic is because I learn from the audience a lot. Um, and so I want you to challenge me and ask questions and also say, that's not how I would have done it. Um, that's not how I would have responded because you have expertise that comes from your own experiences over, um, you know, your life and also probably especially over the last um, few years as we've been focused as a society more on being upfront and addressing these things. Um, so that's just my disclaimer that I don't feel courageous talking um, to all of you about this because I know how much expertise you have in the room. Um, but I also another area of expertise that I have is, is around respiratory viruses. And I could not give 45 talks in a year on respiratory viruses without like wanting to um, quit, like, quit my job. But because audiences are all different, DEI talks, even if they're almost the exact same, um, give me opportunities to do it over and over again. And I learn things as I speak, um, partly from the audience, but even as I recognize things that I should have said or would have said differently. Um, with that said, some of you have done trainings with me before, so that if this feels like too much the same, feel free to get on your phone or take a break or leave and go do the more important things. Um, inclusion requires courage. This this comment, I don't always have it, comes from a talk that I, I gave at a national meeting where I was walking through cases and I shared with the audience um, how I would have handled something. Um, and somebody in the audience, there were 100 people in the room, it was packed, raised their hand and said, um, and I was co-presenting with my house, some of my residents, so I was particularly embarrassed and said, I don't think you handled that with the appropriate moral courage. Wow, that's pretty good feedback. Are you a medical student? Wait, um, <laughs> I didn't think you handled that with the appropriate moral courage. And that, um, could have been a moment where I saw I'm never speaking about this again, but instead what I try to do is say, I don't always, you're right. You know what? I don't always have the right moral courage. And that's why I can show up again in a different way. And that's the same thing for you. If you think like, I don't know how to respond to this. I'm not sure what I should say. That's okay. Um, your courage is made up of a lot of different things. And we're going to do a little exercise where I ask you to think about where does your courage come from? Um, and why why do you sometimes stand up? And, and what are some reasons that you don't feel like it? Um, I always start with gratitude. I want to say thank you. I said thank you to you all earlier. Um, but I want to say thanks to my former residents at the University of Pittsburgh, especially Vivian Chitty. When I became the residency program director, Vivian was the only black person in our training program. Um, when I left the program, 13% of our residents were underrepresented in medicine. And I really give a lot of credit to Vivian to having open conversations with me about what it felt like to be the only one um, in the room. And I um, have a lot of respect and admiration for her. I always thank her for that. Um, there are other folks listed here who have been very supportive of work in DEI and have taught me a lot. Um, and I'll just skip all the way to the end one, which is my nephew, Sebastian. Um, I told Basti that I talk about him in every single one of these, so I'm going to be true to that. So this is him when he was about 12 years old, 11 years old, watching President Barack Obama um, uh, YouTube videos. Uh, he lived in Mexico City. His dad's from Tanzania and his mom is Mexican um, and lives in and lives there. And he said to me, Tia Shanta, we were on a like FaceTime or something. Tia Shanta, your president is a mulatto like me. And I was like, well, Basti, in the U.S., we don't really use that word mulatto, um, but you are absolutely right. His father was from Africa and his mother had white skin like your mother has. Um, and so this is a constant reminder to me of the importance of uh, representation and seeing people who look like you or who have identities like you doing things that you um, think are strong 
or powerful um, or your best um, self. And so he's a constant reminder to me to strive um, for representation and to improve representation. We're not even close um, to being done with that in medicine, obviously. I don't have any financial disclosures about this topic. Nobody um, pays, but I guess the dean pays me to talk about this. Um, and I, but I also, but I do have biases, and so do all of you. And so you're going to hear me say something, and you're going to think like, "Wow, that's kind of biased," or she has a different perspective than I have because you're different than I am. Um, and you can, one of the things I like about you as an audience is that you have different biases than I do, and so we can talk about those. I also want to share why I got interested in this. Obviously, Vivian was a very important person to me, but when I really reflect on it, um, there are two people who were even more important in my journey around DEI than my residents, and that's my parents. Um, so in the middle um, is the wedding picture of my mom and dad, and um, they're celebrating their um, 51st wedding anniversary next month. Um, and they were married four years after it was legal in this country to be able to do so. So the Loving Act was passed um, in 1967. Um, and then when and they would not have been able to be married because people from different race and ethnicities were not allowed in this country to be married together. Now, obviously, there are other identities and communities that have not been allowed to be married, right? Um, in our society until much more recently. Um, I'm extremely grateful for my for the diversity interest that comes really from my genes um, or my life experience. So they would go to a hotel or a motel and there might be a vacancy sign outside. And uh, my dad was in the military. And so they were in Fort Bragg in North Carolina. And all of a sudden they would go in together and the sign would say no vacancy. Suddenly there were no rooms. Um, and I think to this day, and again, this is an example for me of how generational experiences, when we talk about how structural racism leads to people's behaviors today, this is a very salient example for me now. One that I didn't recognize when I first started talking about this stuff um, is that my dad will still be the first person to check into the hotel room. He doesn't take my mother up to the counter because even though like that would be fine today, right? Um, they learned that for them to have a place to stay or an apartment to live in, that he needed to go first, secure the room key, and then go get his bride. Um, and so that's something that I have had the opportunity to sit in the cheap seats in, in parlance of diversity. I am white passing a lot of the time or something else. Um, but my parents had never had that experience to be, um, to look like they were a same, um, a same race uh, couple. The other picture on here um, is, uh, Stephanie Nwangu. Many of you know Stephanie. She is a graduating student um, in a couple of weeks. She's going to an OBGYN um, at Johns Hopkins. She was the past regional director of the Student National Medical Association, our Black medical student organization for Region 3. Um, and this is a picture of her at that um, conference um, from a few years ago. She just completed being the chairwoman of the FNMA, the Student National Medical Association, for the entire nation. So she's basically a rock star. And this is a picture that reminds me of joy. And while we talk about racism and structural racism and police brutality and violence and discrimination and homophobia, we think about all the negative things that happen to people who come from different identities. And what we sometimes have forgotten over the last year is to celebrate what joyfulness and what diversity actually brings that's positive. Um, we are defending it and we're supposed to be allies and upstanders for the identities that are not represented in our own. And this picture of black joy um, is something that Stephanie and I want you to see. There's actually a podcast um, on healthcare workers um, that was happening during the pandemic. And one of the episodes was called Joy. Um, and I'll have a link for that later on. So I just want to remind us that while we talk about all the negative things that can happen, if you ask people about their identities, even if they've been discriminated against, they don't say, I don't want to be that identity. They don't say, I wish I were this other identity. They say, I wish that I didn't get discriminated against, but I want to be who I am. So I was going to ask people to either type into the chat or um, maybe when you saw that this was on the list and you thought, what's Jen doing with this schedule? What were you hoping um, to get out of today? Anybody who's in the room can obviously shout out, is there something in particular you were hoping to get? Or maybe think about it. And if, huh? Is there anyone in there? Were you Not hoping yet. to get something? I'm waiting. Okay. It takes time to, to chat and to think. 
What I want you to do, though, is if you think of something is to either write it down on your piece of paper if you're sitting here in person or type it into the chat so that I can skip ahead and cover it. There's a lot of somebody, um, you know, uh, I'll give an example. I want to learn how to better uh, speak up when I'm in a situation. I want to have more moral courage. I want to um, talk to um, my colleagues in my practice who are senior to me about um, their behaviors. That's something I think we need to um, get some skills around. So there may be things that you think about that you wish you would have. So I have another warm up since that one went swimmingly, um, which is to say, um, let's choose an identity and I'll and I'll do mine first. So I have a few identities. I'm a teacher. I'm a daughter. I'm a parent. I'm a physician. I'm a mom. So we'll talk about why I said mom there just for a second uh, in a second. Um, my passion today right now is diversity and equity. Um, it's good news. It's aligned with my work role. So my job and my passion are aligned. Um, and strength, my strength, my personal strength comes from justice, from role models, which includes medical students like Stephanie or residents like Vivian, um, and a sense of ownership. And that sounds bad when you say sense of ownership. Uh, we've all said things like my students or my residents or my team, right? That gives a sense of ownership. And there's a lot of feedback that says that's negative. You shouldn't say mine of anything. You don't own people, um, which is true. But a sense of ownership can also lead to courage. Um, if you think about those of you who might be parents in the room, if it, you say my children, that gives you a sense of courage when something happens to them that they get hurt as opposed to somebody else's child who you may have some moral courage around, but not the same as the ones that you own. My parents, um, if my parents get excluded from a hotel, I feel differently than if your parents got excluded, although I might have some sense of, of urgency around that justice. Okay, and then the other thing I wanted to do was put this um, picture of um, equality versus equity. You've probably seen the slide of the people standing over by a, um, a fence looking at a baseball game or something. And so that's one image of how equity and equality might be um, different. This one is easier for me to understand than the boxes that they stand on, which is if you give everybody a bike, if I gave all of you a bike, um, and it was the exact same bike, that would be equal. You would all have the exact same bike. Um, but we would have varying abilities to ride that bike depending on our size, maybe um, the type of frame that was there, if we could sit on it, um, and potentially also if we weren't able to use a bicycle and needed one that was adapted for us. And so having something that works for you to make you successful is equity. When we think about our patients and our students, having something that works for our patients that gives them the same uh, ability to be successful, or in that case, to be healthy, if every head had the ability to be healthy, then that would be equity, um, even though they could have the same access to the same medicines. Um, a couple of chats, uh, examples of what students have faced, how to respond to patients, so we're gonna address that, um, resources to support students with DEI, um, balancing the needs of the patient and the needs of the person at the barbed end of the microaggression. For example, though I don't like white supremacy, I do have to provide quality medical care to white supremacists um, or at least people who have unknown but clear racist tendencies. But I also can't allow them to harm my black or Latinx learner. That's a great, um, a great example of, of how we're going to try to talk about this. Um, and it's one of the ones where I think the best tool is often the revisit. I want to circle back. I want to have another opportunity. I want to talk to you about this. Um, I moved here from Pittsburgh, and um, many of you remember um, the murders that happened at the Tree of Life Synagogue in Pittsburgh. I was already living here, but I felt acutely impacted by that. My children's daycare was right across the street from that place when I lived there. And the physician who provided care for the shooter who just shot up um, the synagogue was Jewish. And um, I think that this question is one that's one of those examples where we all go, how does that happen? How do you reconcile that role of doctor and providing care? And can everyone do it? How will our students get into that space? And how do you balance that with the needs of your students? So that's a really complex but great question. So in a few moments, I want you to choose one of your identities or what you are and think about what you are passionate about changing. Um, or and then also who or what motivates you and the other way to phrase that would be where does your strength come from so you might say that my your patients motivate you um, or that your strength comes from that so think about these questions and then I'm going to ask you 
to talk about them. In the meantime, I'll do my obligatory objectives um, slide. So while you're thinking about your identities and what you want to change and what gives you strength, I'm going to help us define and compare bias, stereotype threat, and microaggressions, recognize some etiologies or sources of the bias, and apply tools to mitigate the impact in our professional settings, and then think about how we can advocate for structural changes in our processes. And this is a new objective that I'm adding. Um, I think we think a lot now about what can we do as individuals. We've been reading books, we've been listening to podcasts, we've been listening more intently to stories from people who are our colleagues who experience these things. And then we're thinking, well, what do we do in the medical school? How do we change the curriculum? How do we do that? Now our stretch goal, which is our responsibility because we're physicians and society expects this of us, is what are we doing to change those structures in society actually? How are we becoming the Dr. Monas of the world? What are we doing in our lives to change those structures? Um, and it, it is really our responsibility. Okay. Anybody have an identity that they want to share? Yeah, perfect. Good, I'm typing that into the chat. It's a little bit more nuanced than this, but I'm what I typed in just as a reminder and also to share is that how do we address and understand subtle biases in grading our students' experience? And then how do we talk to them right about it afterward? Okay, cool. Other things that people in the audience want to get out of things? One thing that I always struggle with when talking to learners about this, particularly like in a group setting, is as they share their experiences, inevitably the experiences tend to be bad. Those are the ones they remember. And the conversation tends to feel very down, it tends to feel very sad, even when you're talking about tools and things you can do to improve the experience or like even when you're acknowledging when you may have failed before. And I'm curious if you have any like words of wisdom for how you turn those conversations around into something that feels a little more positive at the end. Um, Cause I often find that it feels like it just sort of dribbles out and I don't know what to say. Yeah, I'm gonna go ahead and I think that the group heard that question on the Zoom, right? I'm gonna go ahead and answer that right away. Cause I think um, one of the things that helps my courage too is that every single time a student tells me one of those bad things, and we're going to go through some and they're going to feel bad. Um, they 100% of the time feel better that you listened or that you asked or that you were that safe place for them. And they know that you don't have the answer to racism or homophobia or sexism or sexual harassment. They know that you're not going to fix it. And they knew that before they started telling you that story. And we are fixers and healers and carers. And so we want to fix it. Um, and what I have learned to be start to be start to be more comfortable with, and maybe that's why the push to like, what are you doing in societal level is to be more comfortable with the fact that um, we have to listen and acknowledge that this is terrible um, and that we're still here you can tell me something really bad and I'm going to be still sitting right here. And we'll talk to you about some of the things that happen. Um, Bella writes into the chat, maybe they don't need it to be positive, but just acknowledged, um, especially when it's hurting, right? Um, balancing that with remembering to see their joy in other times too. It's, it's great that you have this difference that you're here and I'm going to celebrate it, not in a time when we're talking about the negative because that will, um, balance out some of the terrible things that happen. All right. Anybody have an identity they want to share? Yeah. 
Yeah. So um, one of my identities is I'm a military officer and I don't look like it. <laughs> you know, I definitely, especially in civilian clothes and people don't know that about me. Previously active duty, still reserve. I actually commissioned a couple months before 9-11. Wow. So even of that pre-era. And what I'm passionate about changing is the perception that I'm somehow different, different, unique, different challenges, things like that. But we're not all suicidal. We're not all conservative. We're not all from this group, from that group. We're not all 20 year old men. Um, <laughs> basically, there's a lot of perceptions, but we actually reflect society at large. Yeah. That network that I'm in, it is the coolest. I mean, it's a family um, and it's pretty darn amazing. Awesome. That's an example of where having difference in the audience helps improve the way we all think about things. Thank you for sharing that. Any other identities? Well, I'll just talk about the mom thing that I just said a minute ago. Um, usually when you ask people, and it's a compliment um, that I wrote parent or, or said parent, when you ask people to say their identities, they will often um, think first of an identity that isn't, uh, isn't seen, that other people are missing or that's a marginalized one or that is a different. Um, and so, for women, um, working women often, uh, that identity of being a woman is different than the majority group or the leadership group or the people who sit at the table. And so when you want to share an identity, but you only have one choice, you might choose to put two identities into one descriptor. And so parent and mom, parent and woman come together for mom, right? And if you ask, I was asking some medical students to tell their identities. They would never say I'm black and then list another identity. They would say I'm a black woman. If you ask um, men in general um, in these uh, identity questions to say what their identity is, they may say parent because being a man is the like default, <laughs> right? It's the expected thing. Um, and I didn't believe that was true until I participated in these exercises and I realized there were a lot of men in my group and they all said parent as one of their identities. And I thought, wow, you're like, you're a dad. Like, why do you say that? And the facilitator said, well, that's, you know, how this goes with marginalized groups. When it doesn't happen, so when I say parent, it might be because I'm looking out against in a room full of professional people who are all in the same job, who are doing the same thing. Many of you who are women, and I don't feel like my womanness is different than the group that I'm in. If I were sitting at a table with the male department chairs, for example, or the hospital presidents um, in many of our organizations, I might feel othered in that moment because I was different. And so I would need to put those identities together. So when I think about our students, I think about asking them who they are and what their identities are. They often bring their marginalized ones um, to the table. All right, I'm just gonna keep us moving. I like the conversation. I have a lot of slides and I don't have to use all of them because I think we can um, skip some of these things and move towards discussion. If you wanna interrupt, please um, do so. I'll ask some more questions. So this is a case of a 22 year old first year medical student who was an economics major at the University of Michigan and moved to Colorado in the fall to begin medical school. Anatomy was great, but he was really interested in getting to see patients. So he looked forward to his first clinical experience. And this is something that was put into the chat um, in the outpatient ID clinic the week before Thanksgiving break. Spiffy and new in his clean white coat and tie, just imagine first day. Um, Mike arrived to the clinic afternoon early and was welcomed by his new preceptor and the clinic staff. Before they went to see their very first patient, the preceptor paused at the door and said, I want you to be prepared. This first patient might be a white supremacist. I've known him for a long time. When they entered the room together, the patient was sitting with his shirt off and a large swastika tattoo glared from his upper chest. The visit was otherwise uneventful. And at the end of an afternoon of patients, the preceptor left for the airport and Mike went home to study. I'm gonna revisit this case of this experience for this medical student. All of the experiences and cases that I write are, are real um, student experiences. I asked the student's permission to do that, I changed them a little bit. Um, but even if they're recognizable to you, it's okay with the students in any of these scenarios that I share. Um, 
So we'll talk about your different identities and how you might respond um, to this uh, student or this experience. I'll also, this is a chance to remind you that I didn't tell you all the details about this student in this scenario, um, but you have biases like I do. So you filled in some of the blanks uh, with your biases. And that's what the fast part of our brain does. So this book, I'm sure probably a lot of you read it, Thinking Fast and Slow, um, is a book about how we process things. I, I hate doing this if there's a neurologist in the room, um, because um, the neuroscience I'm going to dumb down for you is that um, the fast part of our brain is where the biases live. Um, the fast part of the brain is the things that we do automatically, the assumptions that we make um, every single day. We couldn't go through our lives if we were always in the slow part of our brain, um, because that's where we make the slow part of our brain is where we weigh things and we make decisions and we um, pause and we think about carefully about what we're going to say or do. Um, and this book, Thinking Fast and Slow, Daniel Kahneman won the Nobel Prize um, actually for decision making around economics by understanding the way we weigh things and make decisions. The other way I think about bias is that it, in addition to being the fast part of a brain, it's the part of our brain that's been laid down by associations within society. And those associations can be very strong or not so strong, depending on how long we've had them. Um, so may all of you have taken the implicit association test. All of us have. It measures not racism or sexism. It measures or po politics, it measures the strength of associations in the fast part of your brain, okay? It's a time test, it measures fast um, associations in your brain. And that is actually a measure of how likely you would be to fill in the blanks um, in, a, in a scenario um, based on the strength of those associations. The association that I put up here um, is the Starbucks symbol. Um, all of you would say Starbucks if I asked you what that was. Nobody would say something different, um, but it's actually a mermaid or a Greek goddess. And some people will tell me, well, it's corporate, you know, dominance. And so they may really try to do the politics around it. Um, there's another book called Blind Spot, which some of you have also read, which is kind of the pop psychology version of the science behind the implicit association test. There are a lot of problems with that book, as there are with the IAT, but it is a one tool um, that thinks about measuring the strength of the associations that are in the fast part of your brain. And that's how I think about it. I think about it as a reminder of not do I making me feel bad about the fast part of my brain, but to remind me where I need to slow down and in what scenarios I may be susceptible um, to falling victim to, if you will, my biases. And it's where I would like to transition from fast brain to slow brain. I put the picture up here of a screenshot of the um, IIT around thin and what's labeled in here as fat, a word um, that feels bad to, to use even, right? Um, and the reason I put that there is because patients will report that actually the most common type of discrimination that they receive from their patients, from their from their providers, is related to weight. Um, and I'll I'll tell you, somebody who moved here from uh, Pittsburgh, the heaviest one of the heaviest states um, uh, by BMI in the nation, to Colorado, one of the thinnest. That that um, bias against weight and uh, and towards thinness is very strong in the society and culture. Um, here, and it has impacts on our patients, it has impacts on our students, and it has impact on our hiring practices as well. Examples of associations are all over the place. You can think of even many more. They're in education, um, they're in uh, juries and police officers in medical care, associations that um, bring out our biases. The one that I highlight here is Trayvon Martin, um, who's pictured in the uh, cartoon rendition of the black teenager in the hoodie um, versus um, a white appearing or at least fair skin appearing um, child in a hoodie at the same time. The association between black males and danger or gangs or violence um, is perpetuated in the media um, and has led to some of the biases that we see in the outcomes related to um, shootings. And it also reminds me of the conversations that families have um, with their young black children and their teenagers. And many of you know Kimberly Manning, who was the a graduation speaker here yesterday, uh, last year, and is also um, a prominent speaker in this topic of diversity, equity, inclusion, and narrative medicine. And as her sons and my sons are the same age, 
I become more acutely aware of the different types of conversations she has to have with her teenage boys on spring break as they're hanging out or as they're going to the stores. And all of us have thought about those discussions or heard them now in the media. There are commercials about them. But I really think about in my role, how does that impact our students who come from these backgrounds who have had experiences related to this? And how does it differ in terms of how they show up into our clinics, where they feel safe and where they don't? Another important place where associations come into play is, is in stereotypes. So the cartoon, while wow, you suck at math, while wow, girls suck at math, is really um, a cartoon about um, stereotype and stereotype threat. It's up until 2014 is the latest study that I have seen about this. If you ask children at any level, really high school students, to take a math test and put their name on the math test and then take the math test, the girls and boys will score the same. If you ask the students to put their name and their gender and then take the math test, the girls test scores will go down. That should not happen, <laughs> um, but that's part of stereotype threat. Oh, my name is Shanta, I'm a girl. The stereotype is I'm not good at math because I'm a girl, I'm gonna take this test. Um, and so that translates to differential outcomes in schools. And I think about that as we talk about bias and grading um, and, and various things in our in our school as well. This is a, another example of how these differences in associations really come into light at very young ages. Um, this is the Yale preschool study, um, which was published in 2016, where they asked preschool teachers to look at a video of four children playing at a table and said, watch these kids for trouble. The teacher didn't know any of the kids at the table and none of the tables of kids were misbehaving. They were all behaving fine. And what happened in that scenario is they also used eye trackers to see where was the teacher watching. 42% uh, of the time they were watching the black boys who were sitting at the coloring table. Um, and then you can see that there's a difference that they were watching boys more than girls. So there was this intersection between gender and race at the same time. Fast forward that to medical school. What does it feel like to be watched for trouble from the time you were in preschool as a black male and then to enter a classroom of medical students where you might be one of only a handful or worse in 2016, the only black male in the classroom? How does that change the way you approach your schooling, your willingness to speak up, your willingness to um, participate um, what does it feel like when you get a bad grade? Um, to Heather's point earlier, how do you process um, the fact that it may feel biased and it probably is in some ways? I think you all know why this matters. I've been trying to also dig into why does implicit, how does implicit racial bias really come out in patient care? We all know that there are disparities in outcomes for our patients, right? You can, any specialty in medicine, every single specialty has examples that if you control for everything else, access to health care, insurance, region of the country, educational level, control for everything else, thanks to Rena Williams, there are racially different outcomes that are negative based on um, minority races. And so where does this come from? And, and the one meta-analysis was looking at um, the results of bias and, and disparities and outcomes and trying to figure it out. They used the IAT, and what they found is that People who had increased bias, so more um, dominant IAT scores in one way or another, um, were correlated with poor patient-provider interactions. Um, they didn't go so far as to say that it was all the way correlated with poor outcomes, but poor interactions, and I think we can take that leap a little bit. And that the higher score was also associated with disparity in treatment recommendations, expectations of therapeutic bonds on both sides um, from the patient as well, pain management, and empathy. And so it really um, that suggests that where biases really have the greatest impact is actually in our communication, um, which I think you can extrapolate also to thinking about trust. The study of implicit bias um, and the impact of, of addressing it and changing um, admissions processes, which we do here. So some of you have seen these results. I think most of you, I have to say, shout out to Ty and the Evaluation Assessment Outcomes Office and also to Jen for her collaboration with Ty on this to say, where do these differences come from? Um, when we looked back at our grading up through 2016, I believe, um, we found that underrepresented students um, had fewer honors and high pass than non-under URM students, so majority white students, um, and that the shelf score adjustments um, diminished some of these uh, differences, most of the differences. We also found a difference between honors um, in, in pass in men and women, with men getting fewer honors than women. Um, 
And somehow we also had to struggle with the fact that um, the racial difference feels bad and we're going to, we need to address that. And we're thinking about ways to address it. And we're trying to figure that out. Um, but the gender difference made us pause for a moment and say, okay, well, why is it? Um, what contributes to that? How come um, this is this is different? And I think that's just a, like a reflection back on us about, you know, well, what are we doing to set up a scenario where everyone can be successful with the tools that we provide them, right? Think back to the bicycles. Um, does everybody have access to a tool that fits them? Is that the rubric of how we grade them? So those are some of the things that we think about. Um, here's a summary of that data across the clerkships, which you basically see is that um, it happens in every clerkship. Um, it's tighter in OPC um, for gender um, on the right hand side um, with men and women um, clo having closer to the same scores. Um, and it's more disparate um, in um, PEDS, uh, which is infant, child, adolescent care. Um, I'm glad we're renaming things as we move forward into the LICs. Thank you. Um, and that you see also on the um, on the left hand side, the underrepresented students um, are in the light blue colors and the majority students are in the dark blue colors. And there's a bigger difference there. This is the intersection of men and women. So you can see light colors is the underrepresented men and women and the dark colors um, are the white students, majority white students on the other side. And this is across, you know, five years uh, worth of data. So where do some of these gender differences and minority differences come in the narrative comments? Um, so this is where you can have your eyes open about the narrative comments as they're coming in and question about whether there's bias in there. Think about words that might be better to use. And this is a place where there can be faculty development or reframing of the language. Um, so this is a study that was done by UCSF and Brown um, and that looked at narrative comments in the evaluations of medical students and looked at gender differences and also race and ethnicity differences. And so on the lower right hand corner in that kind of pinkish uh, color uh, versus blue color, you see women on your on the right hand side and men on the left hand side and the comments that were used for honors at the top versus pass at the bottom. And you see language used for to describe women in the narrative comments of their clerkship. Wonderful, compassionate, lovely, my favorite, uh, poised, warm, caring, efficient, empathic. On the other side, for men at the top, great, active, deeper, relevant, certain, scientific, affable. And then on the bottom for everybody, cheerful, pleasant, good, easygoing, sort of a little bit closer. Um, what I like to point out about this is that there's actually a balance in comments, right? So there are blue comments or greenish comments and red comments, right? There's like a, a lot of words being used. They're different, but they're being used. Did you notice also how I read the words on mail? Did you change, change in the tone of my voice? I was more confident. I was a little bit more um, forceful, right? That's maybe my own bias or maybe it's the bias of the language that's actually inherent in the words themselves. Now let's look at the purple and the green. This is underrepresented students on the right hand side. And for those who are asking, well, what does underrepresented mean? It's you, it's the historically underrepresented um, in that group. And the non URM is mostly white, but it does also include um, some Asian majority um, groups. So like I'm part Indian and, and we are a majority group in medicine. That doesn't mean that we don't experience differences, um, but it's it's how these are defined. At the top is honors. At the bottom is pass again. And then I look at the words so many more words that are used to describe people who are from the majority group such a more a bigger breadth of vocabulary so the words that are used exclusively almost exclusively for the urm students are native spanish cultural soft open nice constructive and good the words that were used for both groups are in that upper right quadrant exemplary phenomenal integral thoughtful talented motivated and all those other words were used mostly for people who were from the majority group, including exceptional, advanced, fantastic, superior, stellar, superb, sophisticated. So words matter. And as we're thinking about our, our grading going forward and looking at the way we use words or take words, really focusing, and this is a channel tie and say, really focusing on describing what we see people doing in actions um, rather than just feelings or adjectives. So thinking about describing um, activities, 
direct observation. I think we'll move to a place hopefully where we have more and more direct observation. These de um, descriptors can be divided into language that's agentic, so action oriented. And that's why my voice changed when I was saying competent, thorough, quick learner, confident, hardworking versus warmth based or communal, approachable, warm, trustworthy, eager, polite, compassionate. So how do we um, ask for these words? Are we and do we allow people to be described no matter who they are with both categories of words? Um, so this is just really some food for thought about how we use the language. Um, I translated, um, I translated, I use the tool when I write letters of recommendation now that will ask you if you have gender bias. So you can Google gender bias letter writing tool and there will be several different examples. Yeah. <laughs> studied it and I wonder if it is studied and I'm going to liturge it when I get out of here because this oh yeah sorry so the question um, was about oh, the question was about um, from our Colorado Springs branch colleagues how do the students interpret their evaluations and how do they feel about them because they're noticing that some students who seem to have to be doing well from the LIC director's perspective are actually saying um, I, I don't feel like I'm as doing well as my male friend over here who is crushing it. Um, and one of the hypotheses is exactly that, that the men are saying, I'm crushing it. And <laughs> I had a great meeting with my LIC director for my mid time feedback and good news, I'm crushing it. You want to go out because to get some dinner because we're crushing it. And the assumption is often the males also say, like, you must be crushing it, too. They don't necessarily assume that the their female counterpart is not doing it. Um, and so how do we like tease that out or study that? And one of the th other hypotheses, I think, is that some of these words are being used and don't feel as good. It's what um, we have been conditioned to expect differently. And I'm stepping into stereotype land here. So this is where you say, like, she's really biased. Um, is that males have been more often described in their lives when they're successful and doing a good job with the positive agentic comments that are over there. And women have been conditioned or um, brought up to have some of this more communal base. That is definitely studied that on playgrounds, little girls will play together in groups and have group type games and little boys will do less of those small group-like games um, in their competitions or, or the playgrounds, which is really disturbing to somebody who tries to raise boys, right, who are, you know, have some of these communal-based things. But you do see some of those differences even on the playground. Teachers um, also have some of these biases. The same teachers that have been watching the boys for trouble since they were um, in preschool and have been assuming that the girls were going to be polite and compassionate and eager and team oriented are also conditioning that fast part of everybody's brain to use those words automatically. So I think it does get at the, the long term kind of um, associations that have been in the brain. Shami, you had a comment about this. Yeah, that's what I was say. So Shama wearing her PD hat mentions the fact that 
um, in surgery, if you if you rate self rate that gender um, plays a role in the self rating. And I didn't publish this, but did the same thing in our residency program direct uh, in medicine. So I gave the milestones out at the beginning of internship, all of the milestones and asked the residents to say, where do you fit on these milestones? Like, what's your box? And uh, the female residents who were all picked in the same selection process um, marked themselves two boxes lower um, than the men coming into internship about how they were doing. Chat question. Thanks. I wonder about instead of having blank open spaces for people to just write any comment they think of, if we could get different evals, if we made a list of words for preceptors to think about. Rural pre preceptors will often have no experience or training in this at all. I think that's a great uh, solution. Who said that? Megan, thank you. Um, and the, the solution was to design uh, evaluation form, right, Jen? Yeah, totally, Megan. So um, come tomorrow and you'll hear from Dr. Lockspizer, who's going to tell you about our entire new assessment um, process that I um, hope will address some of these uh, concerns and allow us to do a little bit better in uh, that space. Great. Um, I think choosing is, is a really helpful thing or giving some options to choose is a really helpful thing. I also put it back on you and your team to think about how what we're looking for and being transparent to the students about what we're looking for. And a hypothesis that I have partly related to some of these gender differences where women actually do better, and you can share that with your student um, in our curriculum, is that we are selecting for some of these communal type words um, as what we think is a good outcome in some of our specialties, but maybe not all of them. And the bias allows um, women to be more comfortable receiving those words and evaluators to be more comfortable giving those words to women. Um, I just also wanted to, maybe I should let, let Ty do this, but this is another place where bias can come. There's several different types of bias in feedback and evaluations. One that I, I wanted to highlight was recency feet bias, where the most recently observed performance rather than all within the time frame. Um, and I think this is a huge advantage of the LIC is that you get to see people over time and to watch growth. Um, then there's also the self-serving bias. And this is one that I hadn't thought about very much before, but is it the evaluator's need for the student to do well? And I think the more sense of ownership that we do have of our students and their outcomes, this becomes risky where my student is doing well because of course they've been working with me for the whole year and I want them to do well. I have a great relationship with them. So I'm gonna overlook that their differential diagnosis is kind of crummy because we've been working on this all the time and I have a relationship. So that, and, and it reflects on me if my student's not doing well, how devastating to have a student who doesn't do well. So some, a couple of other thoughts. So I think for mitigating bias and feedback, another, uh, some other things that we can do is to think about the circumstances of the feedback. Where is it being given? What else was happening around that time? Would it have been the same if it was given in another situation? Um, is there agreed upon rubric or language? And you're going to talk about that tomorrow. Do you all look for the same thing and have the same definition of success? Or is my definition of a good student different than yours? It's really important that we have a shared view of what that looks like. Who contributes to the evaluations? Are there differences in outcomes in your program by demographics? So look at your data or ask to look at your data and make sure that even within your small group, you're not doing things, that there's not a difference there. Um, and then look for red, red flag language also, like doesn't fit in, has a good attitude or a bad attitude. Those are not um, actual actions. Their affect or their personality are sort of red flags. Um, use verbs, not adjectives, and give examples of that um, actions. Or use the milestone language, or in our case, the EPA language, um, or another rubric. Um, so the other, the other thing that I think is important about biases in general is to think about when we're most susceptible. Um, and this is important for all of us and also for our, our colleagues who are with the students. Unfortunately, this list doesn't make you feel any better um, because it's when you're fatigued, when you have excess cognitive overload, when you have time constraints, like you're busy and you have a student in clinic, um, when you have ambiguous or incomplete data where you're going to fill in the blanks. 
Um, and also some literature actually from orthopedics that um, it happens with burnout as well. And so I think this is something that's a reality of a lot of faculty preceptors that are going to be working with your students, that they're experiencing these things and they're susceptible um, to these things. It's actually true of our students in some cases as well. Um, so some of the things that we need to do to decrease this is to try to move when it's a high stakes situation from our fast part of our brain to our slower part of the brain. Um, and, and really thinking about slowing down, getting more information, asking a friend to give us um, feedback, having multiple points of information will also be helpful and asking the students to reflect on those situations. Um, so I'm gonna switch gears now, make sure there's no chats, um, and talk about microaggressions and how to respond to them. And I think I just wanna make sure we're all on the same page of what they are. Um, a brief commonplace uh, verbal, behavioral, and environmental indignity, whether intentional or unintentional, that has a potentially harmful or unpleasant psychological impact on the target person or group. Most of the literature is around race, but it also happens with other protected identities. Here are some of the ones that I have, have come through my office, a transgender third year student being asked on a urology elective if she's interested in a career in gender reassignment surgery. A black male faculty member was recruited to orthopedics um, and told in the welcome interview that he must be interested in the city's football team. Several faculty members enter a room and greet everyone except for the staff person sitting at the table so we can have biases based on our power as well. Um, and the first patient of our students uh, meet with somebody with a swastika tattoo on his chest. Um, some other examples uh, that were published in this uh, reflective piece called My Name is Not Interpreter um, is you speak English really well to someone born and raised in the United States. Are you a nurse to a female resident examining a patient? Are you a sitter to a black resident walking into the room? You look too masculine to a self-identified lesbian resident. Minorities are so hung up on race and your people must be so proud of you to a resident with an accent. Taken out of this article, these things are pretty horrible, right? Um, experiences, but, um, and some people may say, well, I don't know if that, how often that happens. Um, if you talk to a group of medical students or residents who come from these groups, they'll say oh, all, like all the time, every day, um, this happens. So there's several different types. One is a micro assault, which is really, um, it should be a macro aggression um, and it's derogatory name calling, using epithets, displaying a swastika. Another is a micro insult, which is a little bit more of a slight. I believe the most qualified person should get the job regardless of race. I leave this on here because I sit as an equity representative on all the search committees for dean, uh, dean level and chair level positions in the school. And this comes up almost every time the most qualified person should get the job. Um, and why does that feel uh, so much like a micro insult is really because it's not valuing the value of diversity. And this is what I call a deficit perspective, that we're looking at diversity from the perspective of what it, it, it um, that we have to do as a checkbox rather than how we um, enhance the excellence of our own institution. Um, and then a micro invalidation is something that Deborah J. Allen used to call micro disses, um, which is that it's actually sometimes intended to be helpful. Um, it has a positive intent. Jennifer, I've never thought of you as a black girl. I don't see color or all life matter. An Asian American being complimented for speaking English well. It's meant to be positive, but it actually is a type of microaggression because it's a communication that excludes, negates, or nullifies the psychological feelings or experiential reality of that person. Um, I talked about moral courage earlier, and um, what I would say this this means is to really find the strength to be able to respond um, and to stand up, to be an upstander. You wear a lot of different hats. Uh, Larry put that picture up of the multiple hats. I'm gonna steal that for next time. You're sometimes a learner, an advocate, a colleague, a friend. You may be a victim. Something may have happened to you. You could have had an experience that was against one of your own identities. Um, and you can imagine that if you're experiencing some of these different roles, your courage to stand up is gonna be different. If you're a victim, you're not gonna have the courage to stand up in the moment. If you're the perpetrator, you might be feeling very courageous and shut down everyone else in the room. Um, if you're a leader, you may be feeling powerful or you may having that drive to my earlier question about what motivates you or gives you strength. Many of you would have put that it's your students who do so. All right, I should have given you a warning before showing you this slide. This is where um, I really think about our responsibility to our students. Um, this is a student who texted me on July 6th or so of 2020 at seven o'clock at night. 
um, first experience. Remember where we were in July of 2020? We were emerging from the pandemic. We had just gone through our first wave. Our students had been removed from the clinical clerkship spaces until um, around this time. And now they were re-entering into the clinical space. So this is where I've shown this slide for a number of years. And until I got that text message and started thinking about my next time I talked about it, I hadn't really didn't really believe it as much as I do now. So this slide is about how a microaggression, like the one I just showed you, and stereotype threat come together to have consequences. So what is the stereotype threat that I'll tell you this is a black female student might have in our school here in Colorado? What stereotypes do we have or does society have about black female students? Okay, good. The, the angry black woman trope that she might be angry or pushy or um, disrespectful or disruptive, some of those things. Okay, what else? What about as a medical student? Right, so the stereotype might be that they're not as talented. Um, they're maybe their uh, step one score is lower or they're not going to be as good or as prepared. Those are some of the stereotypes, okay? Stereotypes can be their own stereotypes, right? Self-stereotype. Any other ones? They may be recognized as janitorial staff rather than other medical students. And I'll take that into the bigger category of I don't belong here. I don't belong here on this team in this role. This is not my role. So that's the. St those are some of the stereotypes that may be going through this black female student's uh, experience as she steps onto an, what I'll say was an all white male ward team um, at the time. So that stereotype is in circle A, combines with a situational cue um, that is the microaggression. And in circle A on this slide, that cue makes the salient, makes salient the stereotype. Patient says that, calls her the N-word immediately. I don't belong here. I was right. Um, I'm not part of this team. I am not uh, a physician student now. And the student said to me, um, I know how to handle this if it happens while I'm walking down the street. I was not prepared to handle this in the hospital. Like I can be called the N-word at a club or walking down the street, or the student had been pulled over and called it by a police officer already. Like I can handle that. I didn't know what to do in this situation. So these come together and then they move to circle B. And what happens to people when this happens is that internal mechanisms kick in, anxiety, negative condition, physiological arousal, heart rate beats faster. My heart rate went up just now while I was talking about it. Reduced performance expectation, not gonna do as well. Reduced effort, reduced self-control and reduced working memory um, capacity. She in fact shared with me I soaked through my brand new white coat in sweat when this happened, like immediately. And then what happens is the consequences of circle A going to circle B is impaired performance, discounting the importance of or the validity of feedback. Her attending said to her, you did a great job today on your very first day on your oral presentation at the bedside. Already, she said to me at seven o'clock at night, I know they said I did a good job, but they were just saying that because of what happened with the patient. Um, disengagement, disidentification, and then a change in professional aspirations can also occur. Why do I spend so much time going through this? Is because I think this is where your moral courage comes from. You are in these jobs to take care of our students, to help them become physicians, and you are the red arrow there, which is the intervention between circle B, the physiologic response, and circle C. So this is the impact is that individuals who experience racial microaggressions have negative health symptoms, depression, anxiety, negative affect. And the social psychologists call this racial battle fatigue, or you've heard death by a thousand paper cuts. I used a very extreme example, but it can be a smaller example as what was put into the chat, still upsetting, but happens multiple times a day to be called the janitorial staff or asked to take the trash or to remove the tray. So you, we, we are the intervention. So there's some positive spin on this is that we can address imposter syndrome and stereotype threat along the way. We can say, you belong here. I 
and you and these faculty, we make you into doctors. We believe in you. We're excited to have you here. Diversity is important to us. We are accessible to you. You have a web of support. We also can design systems that recognize bias, which you're talking about with the grading systems um, and mitigate its impact. We can intervene before circle C. Um, this is another student telling us about an experience that she had of racism and discrimination and being called the N-word. And this is her peer supporting her um, in that moment. What makes me sad about this picture is that the first time I learned about that episode from this student was in this public conversation. Um, and I said, I'm going to start asking. So let's practice a little bit about how we address some of these things. Um, how do we approach the speaker, whether that's a patient or a coworker? We need to role model how anybody can respond in a similar situation. And this is a lot of the stuff around crucial conversations that you have in your life, either at home or at work. So you want to inquire about what exactly happened. Get some more of the details. Describe the actions. Um, paraphrase and reflect back. So um, if one of the examples might be something around um, your your love your love your evaluation says that you're lovely for example let's use that one so you want to talk back or when this person speaker says she's a lovely medical student let me say when you say when you I want to paraphrase back to you when you say lovely you mean she's attractive <laughs> and, and no 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 that's not what I um, meant um, and not, that's not what I meant. I meant that she was very good with taking care of our patients. So like really trying to get some more information about that. Um, there's a chat comment that came through too from Bella. I recently heard about using caution with terms like imposter syndrome because the focus therefore is responsibility of the person instead of the um, on uh, that they shouldn't be so doubtful um, instead of on the fact that society makes them feel like they're not successful. Um, I read that literature recently, too, and I, I think um, it's a really important conversation that we're going to have to keep coming to um, and addressing it not as a problem with the person that they don't feel there, but how do we make the space one where people feel comfortable um, in speaking about things. Express the impact so you can reframe. So let me just like take take a reframe here and say what we're trying to look for is experiences or things that you've observed about this student. Let me reframe that. Express the impact of the statement. When you use the word lovely to describe one of our medical students, I feel uncomfortable or I feel upset because I know that that is a gender charged term. Um, and while you meant well when you were saying it, I would like for you, um, I want to know that we've been looking at the impact of these gender terms on our evaluations. And this is an example um, that we're trying to avoid. You could also um, express uh, your, your preference. I would prefer that we find more language that's more um, broad to describe exactly what they're bringing to the table. Um, you can redirect the conversation if you really can't feel like you're courageous enough to address it right now, and then use something else, which I love, which is the last one, and that's revisit. I wanna go back to the conversation we had last week where you described Shanta as lovely. Um, I agree that she's extremely attractive, but um, what we really want to focus on is how are we thinking about her teaching skills? How is she as a leader? Can you describe for me a few more things that you um, think are actions that you've seen her do? Um, OK, so here's back to our case that you already read earlier in the session um, about our student, Mike, who saw the swastika on the patient. Um, what do you think about Mike? Who is he? What does he look like? What is he? you know, coming to see a good student. Great. So I didn't put that in there, but you didn't fill it in just by your blanks. You said, what can I deduce from this scenario? Why do you say that the preceptor um, thinks that Mike's not white? Uh, Okay, so maybe the, yeah, maybe. Well, and I think here is, would we allow, would we not tell white students that they were gonna see a white supremacist patient or a, a patient with a swastika had to, because what if that white student was Jewish and was coming into the room? But it's, it's, it's important, and this is an example of how diversity improves this. So I would say, if that preceptor would have just walked into the room previously, Having a student who comes from a diverse background in his clinic at this time, in their clinic at this time, um, gives the opportunity to say like, hey, oops, 
I've never realized this before because of my own experience. I've been able to handle this and I maybe I've had white students before and I thought they could handle it. But now that I have this student who comes, he is a black student um, from a person of color, I'm going to pause and be a better teacher and try to explain what's happening here. OK, what else? What else is going on here? So Mike is a black male student. Um, first patient, how would you have handled this differently if you were actually the preceptor? Yeah, what would you say? What words would you say? Okay. Yeah, so we're having an in the room, we're having a discussion about the fact that we might we want to kind of warn I'm sensing that you want to warn the student or protect the student or allow them not to see the patient um, is one of the things. But how do you do that is is hard because we also are trying to teach students to have take care of everybody, right? Um, anybody else? What would you do differently? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so the next thing is, well, maybe we wouldn't necessarily do something differently ahead of time, but we would want to spend time debriefing um, right afterward, hopefully, but we had to go to the airport. So maybe at least next week when we come back um, and saying, how did you feel um, going into there? Would anybody do something stronger than that about besides asking how they feel or debriefing? Yeah, this. The great comment about really important to um, have dedicated time to do this. This is getting a difficult conversation. Student maybe talk about bias in general and other times what they might have encountered it. And in the ch in the chat, the option to not see the patient is important. Most students are self-motivated to see as many patients and all patients, allowing them room for those boundaries. And I say would say, especially early in the year, you know, this is the very first student patient that's ever seen. Um, here's where I like to talk about the orb of the perfection of the profession of medicine. It's like this glowing thing that I want to protect for all of our students. It's so beautiful. Um, and something like this takes a big chunk out of what that feels like. And how do we then now have to heal that back? Well, we could have avoided that chunk right coming out of it, first of all. Um, another comment, it's not okay to go into the room ahead of time to say to the patient and say, you will treat my learner. It's not okay to go into the room ahead of time and say to the patient, you will treat my learner and all staff with respect regardless of color, then giving the learner a choice to come in or not, then debrief as well. Um, that was a question, is it not okay? Sorry, yeah, so is it okay to say to the patient? So I think you can have a, so that's an example, thank you, Mandy. That's an example of how you can have a policy or a structure, which in some of our clinical spaces actually on the wall. We expect you to treat everybody in this clinic or in this hospital with respect, regardless of their identities. Da, da, da. Um, we will you should expect the same from us, like the, phys the physician or the staff um, interaction between the two and those expectations. Teresa, you had a comment about that. Right. Right. So the comment, um, one of the comments was that if we um, only allow certain students, um, somebody who was 
displaying their religion or somebody who was uh, by by appearance um, from a BIPOC group to say, you don't have to go, but not saying to somebody who didn't look like they would be quote unquote upset by it because it's maybe upsetting to everyone to see a patient with this, depending on their experiences or just, you know, societally. So really asking the question ahead of time, should we be allowing students to not see certain patients um, at certain times? My recommendation around that is to think about this, about the timeline and really selecting at the beginning to make sure that people feel um, comfortable just being in the clinical space first before dealing with patients that might be more challenging or have those things. And if you can't do that, doing what Vish recommended, which is to say, let's make sure we have space to debrief it. Again, a wonderful piece about the LIC is that if this happened in your clinic, your preceptor would be there next week um, to have the same thing. And the next week afterward and the next week afterward. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, there's an important chat from Bella that our fear of students not being able to treat the patient uh, with bias is unfounded, a little bit of a distractor. So it's, and I think it's more of our, at least my interpretation is, I'm really worried is the student going to be impacted? How is the student going to be? In, everybody's going to be impacted. Not can the student provide good care? I think the student can provide good care to this patient. And we have lots of examples where um, actually students who've experienced their discrimination themselves may actually be better at providing care to people who are, you know, coming from a discriminatory tone. All right. Let me go on a little bit. Here's another case. Um, this is a first week medical student was asked to spend on the week on the ward. So this could be an immersion and you're asked to facilitate the debrief session at the end of the encounter. One of your students spent the week with a renal consult team and she reports to the group an obese teenager on the service was obtunded and in distress due to volume overload needing uh, urgent dialysis. I watched the procedure as the renal fellow struggled to place a femoral catheter saying, um, she's such a whale, this is gonna be impossible to get this in her. small group of students. How do you approach the conversation with the student group about this? Yeah, so I'm gonna read a, the, the comments in here are really around being our own vulnerability of being uncomfortable and saying, modeling, this feels uncomfortable to me. I'm feeling uncomfortable. Here's what I'm experiencing. Um, in the chat, thanks for bringing this up, up, this example. So quote how you would exactly say it. I'm sorry you had to experience it. Weight bias is prevalent in medicine. How are you feeling now? Um, another comment start by saying, tell me more about that. Tell me your thoughts. And that one is an inquiry model, right? Which actually gets out of the student what they were feeling. I'll tell you this student's response to that question of how they were, what were their thoughts was, I know they were really busy. They were probably post-call. And this is, you know, sometimes what happens is that we don't treat people respectfully when we're overstressed or burdened, um, and which is a quick switch to 
speaking of the hidden curriculum, this is how we indoctrinate people that it's okay to be disrespectful because we're tired, overworked, and stressed. And so a great opportunity to brainstorm around how we prevent that from happening or how um, we might address it in the moment. Anybody think this uh, medical student should have said something to the renal fellow in the moment? Yeah. Yeah. So the comment is really that you don't um, we, we don't really expect that students have the moral courage or power in the list of where they're sitting, especially early on to stand up. I will say students think that in this moment they would have the ability to do so. Um, and and um, so really that's a problem for them. And sometimes they're gonna feel really terrible that they didn't do something in that moment. And so processing with them that actually reporting this and talking about it is a way of being an upstander. We're circling back now. Um, I'm gonna skip ahead um, to this one that's from the clinical space. Um, I would say I was proud of her for saying something, but I would not expect her to speak up, um, to have the power to speak up in that way. So this is a student who comes from a clinical experience and the experience went okay, but the student has described several examples of feeling as if they were being made fun of or not having good surgical skills. The student, a woman also asked that the attending, asked, also said the attending told her, you should think twice about surgery if you wanna have a family. Finally, through tears, she explains, sometimes he also made fun of the patient saying, you know how those Mexicans can be. We shouldn't let them all into our country. There's a lot in here and we're almost out of time. Um, so I just wanna kind of leave this. Anybody um, wanna choose one piece of this to unpack or respond to? Yeah, so one of the comments is really to say, to talk about how they can be different. Um, in addition to doing the things that we were talking about, about checking in on them, seeing how they feel, processing what they thought about it, um, their concerns may come up about the impact this has on their grade, for example, but really saying every experience that we have is an opportunity for us to say what we're gonna put in our physician toolkit and our identity and what we're not. And how would we, if we had more courage, have responded in the moment? I also think about things that they can write to address this. Um, we have resources like the Office of Professional Excellence, like the Equity Office, but they may just even want to reflect and write about it um, so that they can practice how to respond in the future or to get support from somebody like you, um, their, their LIC director, to respond um, in the future. So I'm going to send these slides out to everyone um, so that you can um, think about how you might respond. And I'm also happy to um, do some more practices in the future. Um, think also about um, what every everyone can do. Um, and as I have said in the earlier, to think about where where do you think the bias pops up in your various specialties that your students are entering into? It doesn't happen in the same place in every single specialty. So what are the most likely areas where students might experience microaggressions? Actually also ask all of the students about it. Um, in what settings would they feel pressure to fit in? Um, and where are some examples of language that you've written or read about stereotype? Um, and then where do people go if they need to address it? And I put the podcast in there about black joy. And then just a reminder, um, like the gun uh, violence, um, that this is our lane. And when I think about what would a perfectly um, great place from diversity and inclusion uh, look like. 
from a societal perspective, I saved this picture of this cartoon picture of a Tatiana Jefferson. Um, she was somebody who wanted to be a medical student. Um, and she was shot in Texas while playing video games with her nephew um, when a police officer put a gun through the window in her house. And there are a lot of other people who've died at the hands of gun violence or related to structural racism. But I keep her in mind to say, what would society look like if she got to be a medical student? That includes education, safety, poverty, food deserts, all of the things. If we worked to address all of those structures, could that have allowed a Tatiana to become a medical student? Um, and so we're not there yet, but we need to stay motivated around it. All right, I'm done on time. <laughs> Almost.